they always want to get us out of their way and so david in that psalm the psalmist in that psalm was praying lord don't sleep wake up god they want to annihilate your people and he was telling god what god should do jesus said the time will come when those who kill you will think they are doing god a favor that is the second one the first one is what bastardization of the church this that's something we have to contend with the second one is the annihilation of the faith those who think we should wipe out christianity and of course many efforts have been made i don't want to go into history that every effort that's been made to wipe out the church to wipe out the bible to wipe out the, uh, the, 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 the faith has failed and will continue to fail look god the creator cannot lose in the world he created god is not going to be a loser in the world he created in every situation god remains adonai the all controlling lord god will always have the final word are you listening to me i've gone through a lot in ministry misunderstanding criticism evil speaking attacks but one word always give me comfort no matter what is happening i raise my hand and say god controls my destiny nothing is going to take me out of here till God says your time is up and I don't want to spend one more day when God says my time is up there is nothing there is nothing that is attracting me here the only thing attracting me is to do his will and finish his work are you with me I don't want to spend one more day and I don't care how I die because I'm dead already you can't say you are a Christian and you are not dead you are like a soldier the day a soldier signs into the army he signs his death warrant are you listening to me and you are a soldier of Christ if you are still afraid of death you need deliverance are you listening to me so all this fear of some people are coming to kill you. Number one, nobody can kill you till God says it's over. And when it's over, it doesn't matter how you die. Whether by crash or you are shot or whatever. I don't care. Everybody will die one way or the other. And of course, if Christ comes, we get raptured. Some of us might be lucky not to see death before. <laughs> Because I believe it may come very shortly. Glory to God. So we shouldn't be afraid to die. So all this threat by these men. I, I know there are a lot of questions that may be in your mind. What of our brethren who have died? Nothing happens because before the knowledge, I mean, without the knowledge of God. Nothing. God from eternity to eternity is in control. There are prayers we pray that are not necessary. Father, take control. Uh, has he lost control? And tell me when he lost control that you are now asking him to take control. He's in control. He's Adonai. He rules over all and is above all. He has the last word. Nothing will take your life till God says it's over. Where we run into problem and we give ourselves to the enemy is when we step out of the boundary that God has created around us. There is the boundary of blood if it did them. Goliath could not cross the boundary of blood. That's why they were there. Israel was within the boundary of blood. And they could not do anything. First Samuel 17. We are not going there today. Annihilation of the faith. Then, the last one, which will now be where my emphasis will be, is the eroding of the faith. What's number one? Bastardization of the faith. Number two, annihilation of the faith. And the third one, eroding of the faith. 
this, this one, nobody is trying to, to kill or to destroy. But little by little, we are losing the cutting edge of the faith. Right? We are losing the cutting edge of faith. We are losing faith. Now, let's go back to our scripture. Beloved, which is uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 3. He says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Let's examine a faith in number one. He asks us to contend. Contend means fight. Fight. Contend. Fight. We have to fight for the faith in all the dimensions that I've spoken. But the greatest fight is the fight to maintain your personal faith. The Bible says, the man who has control over self is stronger than the one who wins a city. So, if you are able to fight to maintain the faith, your personal faith, you are better than those who are fighting to take over a city. Now, he said we should contend. Number two, contend earnestly. Number two, he said, for the faith which was once delivered. So, the faith was delivered. What is that faith? Who delivered the faith? Because the faith we are to contend for is defined. It was the faith delivered. Who delivered the faith? What is the faith delivered? I believe that this scripture, which has been used to create division in the body of Christ, because of the many wrong interpretations and the mis application of what Jude was saying by the Holy Spirit has created a lot of things in the body of Christ. We have used it to contend for whose doctrine is better? Whose doctrine is best? Who has real faith? Who has fake faith? Some have put their own set of doctrines as the sound doctrine, as the true faith. And they have despised other brethren whose doctrines may have some variation from theirs. I won't mention denomination, but one of our biggest Pentecostal denomination, one of the apostles who, who was very close to my church, went to my own pastor. Although that pastor is a big man, he's an MD of a big company. And he was saying, look, Big men like you should come to our church because that is the deeper water. It's not deeper life, oh. <laughs> but that's the way he, he said, Come to deeper waters. It means the, where he is. But when he sees me, he will prostrate and he will say, Daddy, you are one of those God has used to establish us in the faith. Now, behind me, he's going to my pastor and telling me he should come to deeper waters. That is where we are, we are shallow waters. Thank God. Pentecostal. Are you listening to me? Let me not even say many, a lot of things that I know about him. Anyway. So, could what Jude was asking us to contend for be actually a set of doctrinal uh, beliefs? I believe it's not. That's not what he's asking us to. Doctrinal contentions has done abominable havoc to the very foundation facts of our faith, which is character. Why did I say that? Everywhere the contention is found, one of the things that Jesus Christ condemned most in the Bible will be found. One, arrogance. I'm better than you. I'm holier than you. 
resentment. In fact, sometimes hate. And of course, these are not evidences of the faith. What have I found out? A lot of the churches that preach holiness. And this holiness are totally centered on the external. How you dress. The size of the mouth of your trouser. Whether you wear Agbada or you wear uh, Buban, you know. Whether you, uh, what do they say? What, how do they call this woman here? Whether you, whether you wear wig or you, what, what, when they do their hair, what, you, will, you place your hair. Some say to place your hair is the best. I mean, it's the one that is holy. Those, are, those of you who shampoo or what do they call the hair, remind me now. Who pan, <laughs> thank you, Jai. Those who pan the air are not holy. Ladies and gentlemen, how did palming and plating and whether the size of your trouser, whether you wear agbada or gown, please tell me, how does it have bearing on salvation? How? How? Some of the some of the scriptures that are used, some of the scriptures that are used, like First Peter chapter three verse seven. It says to the women, "Let your adorning not be that of of outward adorning. That is that of." Plating the air or wearing of apparel. Huh? It means, and people say, he says, we should not plate air. If he says that, he also says you should not wear apparel. <laughs> you wear apparel, you are not plating air, and you are condemning somebody who plate air. Both of you are guilty because it's, it says it should not be the, uh, the plating of air and wearing of apparel. We just take scripture out of context and we begin to contend. Many people are in hell today because we didn't preach the sound doctrine. We told them if they if they, if they, what did you call it the other time? If they palm their hair, they will go to hell. And they thought to themselves, wow, that's difficult. I want to look decent. And so, they have rejected the faith. The first person who preached to me, the first person, I know some of you may not like my face. I'm going to give it to you raw. The first person who preached to me, I was a banker before I got born again. And I was the most well-dressed banker in National Bank in those days. My suit was always very straight, just like Reverend Akinlolu's form. <laughs> you were a national man. Amazing. <laughs> so, when this man and lady preached to me, I looked at them. They were so tattered. They were so out of fashion. I, I, I don't believe in extreme fashion, but I believe in looking decent and nice and moderate, yes. But, in fact, <laughs> I looked at them and I said, well, if this is all about your Jesus, I don't like him. Go away. I don't like him. But thank God, God had mercy. Many years later, I got born again. Of course, I had a lot of trouble. Because in those days, they would tell us, they would tell us, some of you, you say you are Christian. When you buy your clothes, you'll be looking for good tailors. Is it not just to cover nakedness? Why should you look for good tailors? And I'm thinking, 
I have problems. I tried to reduce. I destroyed some of my suit. But even then, I couldn't come to their level. Nothing wrong with the suit, for heaven's sake. Suit is just a way of dressing. This is a suit. They, they approved this, but they didn't approve that one like this one. This one, this man is not born again. He, does, he wasn't born again. Does. I tried to put it away, but I couldn't. It was a big fight for me to remain in the faith. I just made up my mind. If I can't find it in the Bible, I won't let myself be condemned. But many years after I got born again, and one day I was also witnessing on the street. And then this man who witnessed to me many years ago was passing and he saw me. He hid himself. When I finished, finished preaching, he came out and said, Arakone and Leo, so and you know what that I was. Avid minister. I did finish my message that I'm going to close. Everything Jesus did was based on acting by faith on the word of God and contending with every force that wants to divert him from that word. And that was the faith that shook the world. That calmed everything. The storm on the sea. That caused the fig tree to wither. The faith that confronted the officers of his day. I will conclude on this note. Now, after all of that has been said about those exploits of faith that were done by the Old Testament saints. Now the Bible says in verse 39 to 40 of Hebrews 11, I'm concluding, despite all the incredible feats attained by those heroes of faith which I read to you earlier, the chapter goes on to say, and all these, Moses, Abraham, Noah, all of them, those who men who received their dearest to life, all of these have obtained a good testimony through faith. They obtained good testimony through faith. Did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. The message translation puts it this way. Not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on what was promised. God had a better plan for us, that their faith and our faith will come together to make one completed whole. Their lives of faith, not complete apart from ours. The experts of faith determined for the sons of faith in this time is far greater than the exemplary feats attained by those ones. Some, the Bible says for us who are living at this time, there is a better thing. They could not attain the completion or perfection of faith. That's what the Bible says. They could not attain the better part. Hallelujah. They could not attain the bottom part. The sweetest part was yet to come. The Bible says it was reserved for us through the promised son Jesus Christ so the question is what is that better thing than the faith which means they made this old testament sense to live extraordinary lives then the story now continued in chapter 12 where I will end in chapter 12 it gives us the answer of what is this better thing it said therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who are the witnesses? Those Old Testament things who did great things that we look as marvelous today. Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, and all those ones. It says we are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. Weight is not sin. They are right, but they are distractions. 
They are good things, but they are distraction. And the sin we so easily ensnare. The weight and the sin are the things we are to contest with because they are the disturbers of our faith. Let us run with endurance. To endure some things is the, is the fight. Endurance, the race that is set before us. Now, listen to this. Looking, making him our example. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So the one who delivered, the, who authored the faith is Jesus. And it's the one who will bring it to completion. And the faith he delivered was not doctrinal fights. It was a faith that was demonstrated, that demonstrated dominion over the universe, over all things, and caused the will of God to be done. Can I talk to you? Let the election they are doing go on. Parabuka, rabuka. God will overturn it. Nigeria is coming to the end of her woes. Are you listening to me? A righteous king is coming. Verse 1, let me see. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. Can I hear you say amen? Yeah. And, and you are not giving me the one I want. I said new living translation, not new King James. NLT. Okay. Look, a righteous king is coming. And honest princes will rule under him. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind. How many of you know Nigeria needs shelter from the wind? And a refuge from the storm. How many of you know we need a refuge from the storm? Like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in the pastland. The time of the comforting and strengthening of Nigeria is here. In the name of Jesus. There are a lot of contention now, even in the body of Christ. We are divided. You know, according to each party. <laughs> I just laugh. Are you with me? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Author means originator or leader. And finisher means the perfecter. The faith delivered to us is beyond that of the Old Testament saying like Abel, Noah, Moses, Joshua, Elijah. Mighty as their faith was, it was a mere foretaste. It is not in any way to compare with the one Jesus originated, perfected, and delivered to the church. It is the realm of faith never known to man that God delivered to us through his son Jesus. It was the faith he demonstrated in total dominion over all nations and destroy the power of death and hell. The faith that put all enemies under his feet. It was that faith that destroyed the power of Satan and put him to an open shame and obtained for us an eternal salvation. That is the faith that we are to contend for. That is the faith that we should spend time in the presence of God. That until that faith is back in us. I will conclude on this note. Many of you have not started ministry. You will go back to God today. After this moment. And say God. Give me a word. As anchor for my ministry. And you will stand upon that word. Against all odds. You know why I'm in this country? 
Because of the word of God. Otherwise, I'll be living abroad like everyone else. I'm here. Nothing is going to kill me before my time. I know what God has said about Nigeria. Everybody may not believe me. I stand on the word. And we will all see that new Nigeria. Amen. You will see that glorious end God promised you. Amen. Your ministry is bigger than it looks. It's more than church. For many of you. Are you listening to me? Go back to God. If there is any message God wants me to pass across to you. God says, come back to me. Let me tell you the latest news about your life and your ministry. Did you hear what I said? God said, come back to me. Let me tell you the latest about your life and your ministry. And what God is about to tell you will blow your mind. It will change the course of things in your life. It will change your life and the life of many and nations forevermore. Let us bow to pray. There is no way you can respond to the message I try to pass across to you in my own feeble way. We know not how to pray as we ought to pray. The spirit helps our infirmities. Please say this prayer after me. And after that, pray in the spirit until reverence stops you. Say, Heavenly Father, I want to receive the now word about my life and ministry. I want to know what you are saying now. And I receive the spirit of faith to stand on that word and contend with everything. Certain things that we have imbibed that don't have root in the word of God. They may sound good, they may sound uh, logical, but they have no root in the word of God. Look, the final authority on all issues of life and faith is the word. You can't find it, trash it. You can't find it in the world no matter how it sounds. Trash it. Are you still there with me? Paul also admonished us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 12. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses obviously God Paul was not speaking to us by the Holy Spirit to fight about denomination or to fight about doctrine, doctrines I believe the faith that Jude asks us to contend for is the faith of Jesus. The faith of God. The Bible says in Mark chapter 11 verse 22 have the faith of God. Now I know the modern translation says have faith in God. But if you go to the original he says, have the faith of God. And how can you, an ordinary human being, have the faith of God? That's where the contention is. We have to fight for it. And I'll get there. I'll get there. I believe that faith is the faith that Jesus Christ, who is God, came into the world as man. To demonstrate for us 
and he is the one who uttered the faith he started it and after he demonstrated it he handed it over to us that's the faith that faith which Jesus demonstrated which by which he exercised dominion over the entire earth remember that when God created man what was his mandate be fruitful multiply fill the earth have dominion our mandate is the dominion mandate and we lost that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was Lord so Jesus brought back that faith and that's the faith we have to contend for he exercised that faith over sickness, over disease. He calmed the raging on the sea. He cast out devils. He raised the dead. He destroyed the program of hell. He performed the will of God all by faith. Let me quickly take us to the biblical wall of faith. To look at God's gallery of heroes of faith. So that we can lay a foundation for the faith that is worth contending for. Can you please go with me quickly to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 gave a list of Old Testament saints who lived by faith and did mighty exploits by their faith. That is the faith we want to see today. That is the faith the church should be demonstrating today but we are not seeing that all we are seeing is contention over frivolous inconsequential things that have no basis in the word of God the chapter started by defining faith it says now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen that's Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 the message translation puts it this way he says, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. I love that. Is our handle on what we can't see. It went on to mention the first act of faith by the initiator of faith himself which is God right look at the first act of faith by faith we understand that the worlds we are framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen we are not made out of things which are visible hallelujah so the first act of faith was demonstrated by the initiator of faith which is God and the Bible tells us he brought what we see out of what we do not see. Now, we often say God created the world out of nothing. That's not true. He didn't create the world out of nothing. He created the world out of what we do not see. There is an invisible real world of God. And everything we see in the world of man is brought forth by faith from the unseen world of God. And that's where the contention is. That's where the contention is. You see, the contention is what is real, I mean, the truth of the world of God is always in contrary with the realities of our world. Right? How many poor people will say I am rich? How many sick people will say with confidence I'm here? And yet he says, let the poor say I am rich. Let the weak say I am strong. We can relate to that. It's difficult. It's a contention. There is a contention between the truth and reality. Reality is your state of circumstance. Truth is what God has said. The greatest battle we are fighting is how to harmonize the two. How to harmonize the two. Let me tell you. 
the source of all perversion, false doctrine, and fear, all perversion, is when the enemy succeeds in shifting your focus from what God has said. Let me go to the first woman. When God was going to create Adam and Eve, he said, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. Is that correct? Yeah. And that was what God did, isn't it? Alright. And the Bible tells us in Genesis that God always come down in the cool of the evening to have fellowship with Adam and Eve. So, which means they saw God, they talked to God, they related with God. And then one day the devil came and said to Eve, did God say you should not eat? The moment the devil begins to question God or the word of God or the truth of God, don't entertain him. That's the contention. Rebuke him immediately and say, get thee behind me. But Eve entertained the devil and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, in fact, he said we should not even touch. God didn't say don't touch. He only said don't eat. And the devil said, don't mind God. God knows the day you will eat, you will become like God. And Eve said, true? For real? He said, yes, 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 for real. You try. What happened there? Eve's attention was shifted from the truth. If he had learned the truth, if he had understood the truth, if he had imbibed the truth, he would have said, what are you talking? I saw God yesterday. We were made in his image and likeness. The devil was telling him, you are not who God says you are. You are not in his image. You have to do something in order for you to be who God says you are. That is the lie. And so he said, and the thing you have to do is to eat that fruit. Now, you know he ate, she ate that fruit. Did he become like God? No, he lost being like God. He lost being like God. Why? He did not fight for the truth he knew. I am made in the image and likeness of God. Get it behind me. Many of us are trying to become what God has already made us. And that's where your trouble, your confusion, problem lies. Say, I'm whom God says I am. That will involve a fight. Because the devil is going to tell you, if you are who God says you are, why is it that this and this and this and this have not happened in your life? Are you with me? Why is it that your church is not like redeemed? Why is it that your church is not as big as mountain of fire? Why is it that your church is not this? God who made this finger, did he make them all the same? Can this one do what this one would do? Can this one do what this one would do? Can this one, the longest, can he do what this shortest one would do? Everybody has their place. Can I talk to you? We will not all have mega church. Are you listening to me? God gives to each one according to the measure. There is a measure he gives. You will not be rewarded for the size of your church. And those of you who put on arrogant garment because God has blessed your church, you better be careful. And you look down on those whose church is not as big as yours, you better be careful. You know all God wants? Mother Teresa said, God did not call me to be successful. God called me to be faithful. He did not call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. 
And by the way, let me redefine success. Joseph was in the house of Potiphar as a slave. No house of his own. Eh? No property of his own. No business of his own. Nothing of his own. And the Bible says he was successful. How can a slave who is still in slavery be called a success? By the definition we give to success today, it was a failure. So why will the Bible call Joseph a success as a slave in the house of Potiphar? I'll tell you. Joseph was being the man God wanted him to be. Can I come to you? When I left my office this morning, I said I was coming here. Right? And I'm here now. I'm successful. He was a faithful man. He was a diligent man. He was a hardworking man. He was a truthful man. He was a God-fearing man. That's success. Right in the midst of slavery, he was being the man God wants him to be. You know the, the true color of tea. You don't know the true color of tea until you put it in hot water. Are you with me? When you are in hot situations, if you can remain who God says you are, you can continue to walk in integrity. When your church, when some, a, a woman ran to me, she's the wife of one of the most popular renowned televangelists in this city. Big church. He said she could no more stand it. She has to run for their life. She said the husband wants to use her. And she said she was the one who led the husband to what he did. He said because they were working for many years and the offering was not enough. You know, sometimes the offering is not just enough for their, for their greed. Sometimes it's truly not enough. I've been there. I've been there. Many of you may not believe. And sometimes I'm still there. It's not like it looks sometimes. He said, when he was complaining, he remembered that the previous church, that same church is in Nevada here, one of the most popular too. He said, you remember when he was a member of that church? He followed his pastor and his wife to where they did that thing that made the church to explode. So he took his husband there and they did it. And the church exploded. Money started coming, money started flowing. Now they had to service that thing. So it was her turn to be used to service it. And she ran to me for their life. Are you with me? The church is bigger than my own. You will call that success. No. That's not success. If God allocates you 10 people and you preach and teach and disciple those ten in truth and integrity and you deliver them to God, you are successful sir. And there is nothing wrong with desiring for more. If it's possible, I want to be the only evangelist who has won everybody in the world. Hey, that's not going to happen, you know. That's not going to happen. And can I talk to you? The largest number of believers in the world are in the church of 10, 20, 100, 1,000. Not in the mega churches. We are told that there are 66 
million Pentecostals in Nigeria. All right, take redeem, take mountain of fire, take uh, deeper light, take take winners. All right, and a few others. Put all the people that are there. They are less than ten percent. So where are the rest? Ninety percent. They are in your church and my church. Now, I'm not saying this to make you not to dream, but to prevent you from crucifying yourself. To, to change your mind from thinking you are not a success. If Joseph was a success as a slave, if you are doing faithfully what God has called you to do in all the integrity of heart, you are a successor. Are you still there with me? I'm diverting from my message. Early in ministry, God taught me something. And I want to share it with you. He taught me total dependence on God and not on my congregation. Let me share a few testimonies of my life. I lay in ministry. And it's the same testimony till I'm talking to you today. Many of you, you see Kokola and you think he's a rich man. I am a very rich man. You know how rich I am? I'm, I'm rich in faith. I'm rich in faith. When we started ministry, we needed a house. Of course, I didn't have money to get a house. We were just praying and believing God. My wife and a friend of his, of hers, who was working in Ondo State then, in, the, in one of the ministries, Ondo State, one of the ministries of Ondo State government, heard about it. And she said, when you get the house you want, Please come. And I will give you the money and you can pay me whenever, anytime. So we got the house. It was 800 Naira. Is it? 800. Yes, 800. I'm talking about 40, almost 40 years ago. 800 was big money. And she gave us the money and we got the house. Three bedroom house with big sitting room. And we had no money. Now, at that time, all those state civil servants were not paid for eight months. God went to a woman who had not been paid for eight months to give us the money we needed for rent. That is God. When our first child was going to be born, we were still strugglers. No money. I had a friend, a very close friend, who worked in Union Bank. Are you with me? I may not finish my message. It doesn't matter where. When it's time for me, just let. I can stop now if you want me. This friend of mine worked in Union Bank and they were paid well. This friend of mine, even before I, when I arrived in Ibadan to start ministry, I stayed with him in his house. He has his own house which he inherited from his father. Then later we rented our house. When it was, he was working in Ibadan. And then they transferred him to Lagos. Right? After about two months, we got our house, we settled in, and our child was going to be born. They transferred him from Lagos that they transferred him to two months ago back to Ibadan. Are you still there? And my friend said he was not going to stay in his own house. He wanted to stay with us in our own rented apartment. Are you listening? Our child was born when he was with us. All the expenses we need to do, he carried it out. <laughs> After we named our son, they transferred him back to Lagos. <laughs> Let me tell you how we got our first car. You know, before that, the day our son was going to be circumcised, the midwife or nurse, a matron, matron nurse, who was to do it, came. 
he said he had been booked by a matron who took who, who, who midwives the birth of her son. He had been booked the day her son was born. So he came. When he came, what shall we say? We didn't have a dime. Yeah, my wife. I gave the I always walk, walk in faith. Say, welcome, ma. Thank you very much. I gave the child to her to start to do her work. Me and my wife went into the room. What shall we do when he finishes? <laughs> what shall we say? We prayed. So, I went to her when she finished. I said, thank you very much, ma. How much is your money? She said, the person who booked me paid. Are you still there? I'm telling you the faith you should contend for. Because many of our misbehavior is as a result of the enemy shifting us from faith. Eve didn't misbehave until she believed that she was not in the image of God. And then she started trying to be in that image. And that's how she messed up. Now, when we're going to buy our first car, this is how it happened. At that time, we have started doing crusades. When we are going, I remember Adu I remember Ikara Kitty. As at that time, we were having a crusade where there will be 5,000, 10,000 people. As an, a, a small evangelist just starting, that's big. And then, when we we're going to the city, it's me who will be carrying poster on my head. This big evangelist carrying poster. So it became very uncomfortable. So we are praying for a car. My wife was still working there. She was working in the Ministry of Trade, Federal Ministry of Trade. It was the time they were asking all the ministries to move to Abuja. Are you with me? So they had gazetted how the ministries would move. The first ministry to move was Ministry of Internal Affairs, followed by other ministries. It was not the turn of Ministry of Trade where my wife was working. But because we were praying and said, God, we needed a car. The minister of trade just came to the office one morning as like a drunken man. He said, all of you, get ready. We are moving to Abuja. Go, you officers, go to the treasury and collect your movement money. It was like, okay. <laughs> By Gesset, the first ministry to move is Ministry of Internal Affairs. They have not moved. So it was like, is this man drunk? But my humble obedient wife didn't argue, just went to the treasury and collected 10,000 naira. That time. That's how we bought our first car. God changed the plan of an entire nation for the sake of one little servant of ease. God can change the program of this nation for your sake. Are you with me? You see, when you are called to ministry, sorry, Reverend, I think I've departed. When you are called into ministry, there is one thing you must get from God. A word. Everybody say a word. And for the rest of your life, hold on to that word. You must have a word that shows you that God called you. If God called you, when things are wrong, you can challenge him on the power of that word. If God didn't call you or you are not sure, go back to God. Go back to God. Go back to God and say, Father, give me a word concerning my ministry. There are some things God is doing in my life right now. Thank you, sir. Right now that I will not be able to talk about right now. Because, again, we have to be wise. Let God finish what he's doing before you start shouting. Incredible things in righteousness. Are you with me? I got to a point that I asked God, can a human being ever of my level ever achieve this thing? That God gave me a word. I will go back to that word. And I will stand on that word and place a demand on that word. I can't believe the things that are happening. I believe I'll be able to share very soon. 
in the nearest mission. Are you listening to me? I'm sorry, sir. I, I don't understand this. The countdown LED at the back. I can see. This one? Oh, it's on. Oh, thank you. I've not been using it. Thank you very much. Is it going to indicate my time? Oh, I did bar. So I have 32 minutes. 40. Oh, thank you. Plenty of time. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Praise God. Let God give you a word. Fight to stand on that word. Circumstances will come. Situations will develop. The wind will blow. Satan will come against you. You must be able to say, God spoke to me. Everything will roll and roll and roll and come back to that word. Everything. No matter what happens. Everything will roll and roll and come back to that word. That is the faith we are to contend for. Hallelujah. So, men and women we, we, we saw in that Hebrews chapter 11 the list of saints of old who followed God's leading these were ordinary human beings who were subject to the same frailties as us but through them believing the word that God gave them performed the will of God they made a mockery of Satan's schemes. Setting captives free. Bringing help to people and to nations. There are certain things that are happening. That God is setting up. Changing the story in Africa right now. Unimaginable things. But by the word of God. So we are talking of men and women who obtain righteousness as the scripture put it. Men and women who escape death. Men who build the act to escape the judgment that destroyed the entire world of the ungodly. That's the faith. Men who follow the leading of the spirit in strange land to obtain the promised generational inheritance. That is the faith. Men who receive strength to conceive and bear a child at old age in a womb that was as good as dead. That is the faith. Men who predicted a sure future for their gen unborn generation. Men who defied the kings, the mighty men of their day. Men who escaped the power of the destroyer like we are seeing today. Men who opened up the sea and created a pathway for the people of God to pass. Men who brought down walls of the city so that the people of God may conquer and cross to their inheritance. Men who subdue kingdom. Men who walked righteousness. Who obtained promises. Who stopped the mouth of lions. Men who quenched the violence of fire. Who escaped the edge of the sword. Men who out of weaknesses were made strong. Men who put armies of the aliens to fly. Men who received their dead raised to life. And those also who through faith endured untold persecutions and they refused to renounce their faith even unto death. Ladies and gentlemen, the power to do these things that are listed in scripture which I have just read to you came from that which is born of God in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we should contend for. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. 
What is born of God, therefore? Our faith. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. That faith that overcomes anything the world can present. That faith that is born in your heart through the Spirit of God can overcome anything. Persecution, hunger, anything. Misunderstanding, criticism, armies, storms. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. And how does that faith come? That's where the contention is. It is by staying with God. God bats the faith in us. When we stay with him in the place of prayer, in the place of study and meditation in the word, that is the greatest duty of a man of God. Stay with God in the place of prayer and the study of the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus spent most of the night in fellowship with his father. And then by the morning, by faith, he did all the things he did. Calmed the storm, spoke to a fig tree, and it dried up by his word. He commanded dead men that had decayed in the grave to come forth, and they came forth. He spoke to a mighty storm and he gave way to a mighty calm. Are you listening to me? This we are the faith that Jesus Christ demonstrated and handed over to us. That's the faith we should contend for. You will have to contend with your flesh. Flesh doesn't want to pray. Flesh cannot stay too long in the place of study of the word of God. Flesh wants to be full of activities, galvanizing all over the place. Paul said he had to discipline his body. Hallelujah. We have to discipline our body to do the things that will grow and strengthen our faith. You see, many of us are hasty to carry out ministerial assignments. Friends, first of all, stay. Discipline your body to stay. Stay with God until you hear a clear word about that project, about that plan, about that purpose. A lot of heartache that we create for ourselves. A lot of, uh, a lot of sufferings that we create for ourselves are uh, because we didn't hear God before we jumped out. Now you're going to ask me, does it mean if I hear from God, there will be no challenges? No, there will be challenges. But you will overcome them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But what? The Lord deliver him from them all. The Lord deliver him from them all. Make sure you hear from God. Make sure you hear from God. One time we needed a, a facility for our ministry. We are occupying one opposite Polytechnic South Campus. And just close by to us, there is this big building that's been neglected, that's been abandoned rather, for many years. So I searched, I, I fell in love with it. I searched for the owner. I got him in a place in Ijebu, where he lives in Lagos. So I went to Lagos, met the woman, negotiated and I paid for the house and I was happy and I came to announce to the brethren in our fellowship so we are getting ready to raise money so that we can renovate and then one day the owner of the house just drove to my office and said reverend we are sorry I've now given the, I've transferred the house to a housing agent go to him he will give you your money